All right. Thank you, John, for coming to our class and uh, discuss your book and its relationship to things that we want to learn. Well, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, it's always uh, interesting and challenging to explore these ideas with, across disciplines. Um, but I think it's very critical that we do so. And uh, I, I think that's one of the things that uh, Amit's commitment to building cross-disciplinary interactions on campus, I think, is a, a real, one of the really strong positive assets of having him here at Wright State. So what I want to do is talk about what matters in terms of design and improving performance of cognitive systems. And you know, when I say cognitive systems, the uh, term is kind of currently being used, social technical systems. You know, I'm talking about potentially teams of people, including technology, autonomous systems, um, to solve problems, practical problems in the real world. And uh, today, you know, in talking about this, I think it's important to go back to very basic assumptions that we make, metaphysical assumptions. And this, this is a quote from uh, William James, and it says that, you know, metaphysics means only an unusually obstinate attempt to think clearly and consistently. And as soon as one's problem purpose is the attainment of the maximum of possible insight into the world as a whole, the met metaphysical puzzles become the most urgent of all. And the, the subtitle to my talk is Escaping That Dichotomy to Explore the Duality of Mind and Matter. And a lot of people think dichotomy and duality are synonyms, but there's a really important difference. Dichotomy suggests that there's two different kinds of things, so different types. Okay, a duality means there's a relationship, and that relationship is indeterminate unless you know both parts of that relationship, the components of that relationship. So a dual requires you to, to know both, and, and what I'm going to argue is that mind and matter are a dual, not a dichotomy. But that often what we have done in our science, in separating psychology from computer science or, or physical sciences from social sciences, we've created a dichotomy out of what actually is a duality. So, um, Amit sent me, yes? So, when we talk about duality, are we referring to the same thing uh, and trying to look at it from two different, uh, or trying to look at its representation as two different things, or just are we talking about two things and there is a relationship? We're talking about a relationship that has two variables. Okay. And then unless you know both variables, you can't specify. So it's a function of A and B. Okay. And if you know A, the result of that function is indeterminate until you specify B. That's what I mean by duality. Does that make sense? OK, so and uh, the, the uh, keynote address from John Soa, uh, Ahmed sent me. And I know you talked about that last week. And I liked a lot about what he had to say. And there's a lot of overlap between what he was saying and what I'm saying. And you know, basically, just to remind you, one of the theses is an intelligent system must be more than a collection of algorithms. Okay. It must integrate them in a cognitive cycle of perception, learning, reasoning, and action. The cycle is key to designing intelligent systems. And, and in saying duality, what I'm saying is, is the cycle as a whole you have to understand the parts, the A's and B's, in relationship with that functional relationship. And you can't go the reverse way. You, uh, the function, the, the cycle, you, you cannot take any of the parts out of that cycle and understand them independently. And, I, and I'll demonstrate why throughout this talk. Now, if we think that uh, we can um, achieve some level, not necessarily the human level, but some level of uh, perception, learning and reasoning <coughs> algorithmically or through basically software or you know software processes yeah uh, no is there, i'm there saying no you can there, you right? can implement the, the i'm not saying these are unique brains hmm. but i'm saying that if you want to solve the problem for example if you want to design a, a robot that can move around the world independently then you've got to deal with the perception action 
and cognition problem as, as a unit. So you've got to understand the layout of the environment that robot is moving around. You have to know, you have to understand the kinds of information that are relevant for distinguishing shadows from objects. Okay, and you have to build a logic so that the decisions the robot makes are consistent with smart choices in that environment. So you have to understand that environment. You know, when you're designing computers on desktop to solve puzzles, then you can, you can do all the cognition and symbols. There's no perception system, because you've done it for it. There's no action system. Everything, you're just manipulating symbols. But as soon as you talk about things that move around in the real world, and where success depends upon making the right choices in, in ecology, then you're talking about perception action systems, not symbol processing systems. And that's what we're going to talk about. Is and, and today, you know, compute... What is the difference between perception action? What is the distinction? I didn't get that. Uh, perception actions versus symbol processing is... Well, well okay. you know, that, that will, that's what the whole talk's about. Okay. So, so we'll get to that. Okay, so... So there, there's actually four points that I want to make, four different aspects of looking at this problem. Uh, in order to look at the perception action cycle, you have to know something about the nature of the dynamics of circles. So anybody, any of you guys have a background in controls, control systems, taking a course in controls engineering? Yeah, and that's really unfortunate because, because that's going to be critical to this. Uh, and, I mean, not, not to understand, well, it may be important for understanding what I have to say, but, but one of the things that I think it's very fundamental, there are fundamental aspects of closed-loop dynamical systems that many people in design, in computer engineering, and in social sciences don't understand. And I think it leads to a lot of confusion. So uh, this is actually a depiction of one of my first days in graduate school. And I got my PhD at Ohio State in uh, human performance, working with Rich Jagosinski, my advisor, the, the gray-haired guy over there. Um, I'm, I'm actually, this is before I had gray hair. So, um, and Rich was trained as an electrical engineer first. So he got his degree in double E uh, from Princeton, and then he got a PhD in psychology human performance from the University of Michigan. And my first day in graduate school, I was working for Rich as a graduate research assistant. My first day in graduate school, he sits me in front of an analog computer. I'll bet you nobody in here has even seen an analog computer. And an analog computer is programmed by wiring and you're building circuits. And he, he sits me in front of the computer and he says, now of course you know you put two integrators back to back in a circuit, you get a sine wave out, right? Everybody knows that, right? Okay. Well, I didn't know that, and, I, I, and at that point I had very little calculus, but we spent all, all my graduate as a, getting a degree in psychology, but taking engineering courses and trying to and learn about control systems and mathematics and the logic of control systems. And what we were actually doing was building models of pilots in the loop, in the control loop. And there's a very important classical experiment that was done by McGrew and Jex, but, but the basic logic of these experiments so what we want to do is model the human, and the, the human is given a tracking task. So there's a cursor on the screen, and what we do is perturb that this cursor. And their job is to compensate. So when the cursor moves this way, they move their control the other way and bring it back to center. So it's like keeping the cursor in the center of the screen is like keeping your car in the center of the lane when you're driving. So when the wind gusts push you this way, and, there's, and what we can do is, is we put a sum of sine waves in here, and then we look at the, the human's action, and we can correlate with those sum of sine waves, and we can actually build what's called a describing function. We can look at the input-output relationship and actually build a model of the pilot. And this work was, was actually supported by the Air Force. A lot of this research, the funding for it came out, and a lot of the early research was done at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And the idea was that they wanted to model the human in terms that they want to be able to predict the stability of an aircraft. So they want to be able to have a model of human tracking ability, human piloting ability, that they could then plug into aerodynamic models of the aircraft and predict whether the aircraft would be stable or not. Okay, and this is the results. So have any of you guys seen a Bode diagram? Do you know what a Bode plot represents? 
So, so it turns out, so, so one of the independent variables in this experiment was the dynamics of the vehicle that they were going to control. And th what this represents, and, and all you, you don't have to un really understand this, we can just do it symbolically, that the pattern in here represents different kinds of dynamics. And this column, given a simple proportional control system, this is what the transfer function of the pilot looks like. This, this is frequency over this axis. And so he says the good frequencies, they have a high gain. And as, it, as the frequencies get faster, as the thing moves faster and faster, their gain gets low. And, th and this, in a sense, you can say is this, is, this person is a low-pass filter. And this is a phase lag. And this pattern is corresponds to time delay. So this makes a lot of sense in terms of modeling the human. The human is, this is, in a sense, an integrator. But a low-pass filter, they can follow slow signals but when the vibrations, when the, if the signals are too rapid, they can't follow them. They, they, they can't follow signals at these high frequencies. And they have a time delay. There's some delay in terms of when, this, when the error appears to the time that it takes for them to correct it. Makes perfect sense. And it turns out that once you know the, pi, the human transfer function, the plant, you can add it in, in, in the Bode space, actively the, the human plant system can be predicted based on the sum of those two things. So literally, graphically, you can add these. So this is a constant. This raised a little bit. This is zero phase lag in here. So all you see is the, the lags of the human. OK, but now we have a model of the human. What we want to do is be able to predict the performance of the human in other vehicles, in real air vehicles. And, and so here are some other kinds of control dynamics. So these are different plants. And the question is, is how do we generalize from this experiment to now predict the performance of the human plant system when, when the plant changes. So what, what would be your prediction? So we know what the transfer function of the human is, right? So we just plug that in here. And now we have to add these two things. And that should give us the human plus the plant, right? Do you, do you see that, how that would work? But that's not what happens. Okay, this is the actual results that you get from doing that experiment. And the, the, the funny thing here is, look at this. The transfer for the function for the human is not the same. When you change the plant dynamics, the transfer function for the human changes. And this is one of the, the things that make humans difficult to model, because there is no stable input-output relationship. You change your behavior depending upon the context. So for example, you know, in driving, the statistics suggest that a 16-year-old with their parent in the car is one of the safest drivers. And a 16-year-old with other 16-year-olds in the car is one of the most dangerous drivers. So I mean, that just illustrates that, that the the kind of driver the person is depends upon the context. And this says, well, the kind of pilot the person is depends upon the kind of dynamics, the vehicle dynamics that they're controlling. But as scientists, what we're looking for is the invariance, right? So we're looking for the, the lawful relationships. And do you see any, any invariance here? Do you see any commonality in this diagram, in this space? Look at the human plus plant column. The human plus the plant. Look at this column. Look at this pattern. It's, all, it's, 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 it's very similar. And why is that? Why is there invariant at that level? And the reason is that it turns out for the closed loop system to be stable, Okay, if the closed loop system, the whole dynamic to be stable, the plant, the, the control, the forward loop has to have this characteristic. And the reason is, is it has to, it would like, it has to have high gain for the signals that it, that where the, the, the phase lag is small, and that means it will track those signals. 
But if it has high gain when there's a, a large phase lag, so if it tries to overcorrect, what's going to happen is you get what's called pilot-induced oscillation. That is, it's, it's so far behind the signal that when it tries to control, it's actually, rather than correcting the error, it's actually going to exaggerate the error. Okay, and this, this often happens in, this has happened when the uh, Gripen aircraft was fielded by uh, the Swedes. If you, you can go online and, and you can get Google that and you can get, see film of pilot-induced oscillations. In the, in, the, in the air show, one of the first flights, the, the control system was too sensitive and the pilot overcorrected and went into oscillations and crashed. And then the Swedes realized they had to look at this kind of research and design because they had made errors and designed the control system. But it turns out the simple you know, control engineers know that to be stable, you have to have your gain has to go through 0 dB before your phase margin goes through 180 degrees. Otherwise, the dynamic closed loop is not going to be stable. So the key is, this is requirements, this re reflects constraints on stability that apply to the, the whole loop. Okay, and this doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's an electrical system, whether it's a, any servo mechanism, any control system, it doesn't matter whether the human's in the loop or not, any, it could be prey-predator relationships, any dynamic relationship has to satisfy these constraints to be stable. Otherwise, the system's going to crash. It's going to go unstable. And so the parts have to, the human has to do whatever it takes so that the sum, so when you vary the plant, the human has to vary his behavior in a way so that the outcome satisfies the constraints at the go of the loop. And, and this is very important because much of our work as scientists are organized around the reductist, reductionist philosophy that means well, let's break it into simple parts, and the assumption is if we, if we understand the parts, then we can predict performance of the whole. Okay? But once you close the loop in a dynamic situation, what this says is the whole sets up a context, and unless you understand constraints at this level, you can't make good predictions about what's going to happen at the parts. The parts actually change their characteristics in order to satisfy laws that are specified at the level of the whole. The laws don't exist as a part. Okay, the laws of survival are set at the level of the eco-animal interaction. It's not set in terms of the animal or the ecology. You can't understand evolution, you can't understand natural selection if you only look at genetic variation or if you only look at environmental conditions. It's a relationship between the variation it's, it's, that, it's a duality. You, can't, you have to look at both sides of the equation in order to understand the dynamic. So this is, in our book, by the way, the book is a collaboration with an industrial design engineer who's a cartoonist. And this is how he illustrates. So it's pretty obvious that if we change the vehicle that the person is controlling, they're going to have to change their control strategies in order to stay in to stay upright. I mean, this is this is a natural intuition, but we don't understand this. So, so it's you know, it, the person doesn't have a strategy for walking, and then you put ice skates on them, and then they do that, apply that same strategy. They have to they have to coordinate differently. They have to be a different kind of machine when they're walking on ice skates than they are when they're walking on roller skates or when they're walking on on bare feet. We have to adapt to the constraints that our ecology sets for us. Okay, so I think it's critical to understand this dynamics of circles anytime you have a closed loop system. Okay, and if you can point out any cognitive system of interest that's not closed loop, let me know. <laughs> but I think almost all cognitive systems, I mean, that's the essence of cognitive system, is a system that interacts with the environment and then adjusts its behavior based on the feedback it gets from those interactions. When we're talking about cognitive systems, we're talking about closed loop systems, and unless we understand the dynamics of closed loop systems, our questions, the way we interrogate, the way we parse those cognitive systems is going to be naive and problematic, potentially. So every human is different. Uh, uh, every human reaction is different. Uh, where, in the, where in this you model that part? Well, the uniqueness, so, their experiences are different, their, um, you know. Well, here, okay, so if you, 
say you're this and you want to be this human and you, and you try to do it here, you can't keep the thing on the screen. You, die, you don't survive. You have to conform. You can, there are, in, when we look in complex environments, oftentimes there's multiple solutions. But you can't choose how to drive a car. You can't choose how to, you know, there's a limited number of solutions. And, and so if you try to fly an airplane using the strategies that work driving a car, you are not going to live very long. Right. So you have to adapt your behavior. So that's all we're saying. And so within, in many, as you get to complex environments, oftentimes there's not a single solution. There's multiple solutions. And, and there'll be individual differences. But, but that'll come up actually again. We'll get to individual difference actually in this okay. that section. Yeah. Something is not so clear to me that you say that it's a closed loop. Uh, conversely, it's a kind of dynamic circle. Mm -hmm. so They're the same. That I don't distinguish. So dynamic is not um, opposite to this closed loop because in no, there's not up, they're both dynamic. No, it's complex. It's, it's all I'm saying is is a closed loop system means that you behave and the behavior has consequences that feed back and, and change how you and, and have impacts for the next behavior. Any, any complex system, I, I don't care whether it's totally physical, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be cognitive. Any, any system where the output of its behavior impacts the, the situation it's in and then future behaviors have to adapt to that situation is closed loop. And I, you know, I don't have a, I don't have this example on this slide, but there's a, there's another, there's a, a really good example that that illustrates this coupling in terms of uh, termite nest building. And so, so African termites build these really elaborate structures. Nests. And the question is, and that that they're, they're nests, and they have, they 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 uh, become the basis for their, you know, their they're living, they live inside that thing. How do they know how to build those things? Where's the information? Where's the, where's the rule? Where's the plan? Is there, is, there a, is there a, you know, foreman termite telling people exactly where to put their crap in order to build the, the walls of this system? Is it a code embedded in their genes? How do they know? And, and it turns out that one, the dominant theory right now for how they know is, is they don't know anything. They have very two simple rules. They fly around the room, world and they eat. And then at some point they get ready to make a deposit. So they get ready to defecate. Okay? And these insects, and the, when they defecate, the material, that becomes the material for building the nest. Okay? And these insects have just simple rule. If they smell the pheromone, of a previous deposit, they want to go and deposit on top of that. Okay, so it's like if you have a dog, you know, they sniff the environment, if they smell another the, the scent from another dog, they're gonna they want to put their deposit on top of it. Okay, it turns out that if you if you have a few insects in a small space, then you get random deposits. Okay, but if you put a lot of insects in a small space, what happens is it's, there's a high probability, because it, in, if there's a few insects, if there's a low probability that there's going to be near another deposit when they get ready to go, so they're just going to dump it wherever they are and just get random deposits. Okay, but if you have a lot of insects in a small space, there's a high probability that when they get ready to defecate, they're going to be, they're going to be within the range of a previous defecation. So what you stand is you start to get piles. Okay, and the piles, as each insect deposits in the same place, the pheromone gradient gets stronger and stronger in attracting others. So you get a positive feedback and you start getting piles. And then the piles start interacting, so there's a bias that the pheromone gradient is stronger on the inside of these piles, so they begin to lean toward each other. And then they come together as arches, and then arches interact to get interaction between arches and you get roofs. And it, so it turns out that this is a closed loop system. The insects are moving around, they're dro dropping pheromone. Okay, so the insects are causing the pheromone gradient, but then the gradient, the pheromone gradient is feeding back and determining future interactions of those insects. Right, that's a closed loop dynamic, that's a dynamical system, it's a classical dynamical system, but that il illustrates the dynamics of how this system, and 
I all what we we believe that's a metaphor for all cognitive systems. You behave in your ecology, your behavior shapes that ecology, that ecology then and also feeds back and then shapes sub, subsequent behaviors. But let's let's move on to the second point. And here's probably closer to your territory. Yes. So uh, there is no conscious interpretation of the feedback required, is it? That sort is the subtle and Yeah, so yeah. So so the in so in order to get for nests to evolve out of this dynamic, mm -hmm. the insects don't have to know anything about nests. All they have to do is have this preference to go where the peak is in the pheromone grade field when they make their next deposit. It will emerge, the structure emerges from the dynamic of the interaction. It's not imposed by a plan in the insect's head. It's not imposed by a structure in the environment. Because there's no pheromone out there until the insects start, start laying it. See, this, is what, this is what we were talking about last time when I said you don't need high level rules to explain every piece of complex behavior. It emerges from lower level properties. Yeah. I think and in fact, if your rules are as complex as a phenomenon on the outside, then they're not doing anything yeah. for you. So, so this is, you know, so th this, and this is the whole thing about dynamical systems, is how to explain how very simple rules can lead to very organized, highly organized behavior in the world. So the, the chaotic dynamics, but so this, what we're talking about is self-organizing systems. And we believe that cognitive systems are self-organizing. So, uh, uh, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand it. It's really Interesting. Uh, then why these rules are there is a very philosophical question. Are they? Okay, okay, well that's, okay. <laughs> hold that, hold that, because, so any of these angles, each, each of these points I'm going to say is going to come at this at, at a different angle. Okay. And so a lot of your questions are going to be resolved when we look at from different angles, from other angles. And so the, the, the second angle I want to look at is from the semiotic triad. And I assume that that maybe computer scientists know a little bit about semiotics, probably more than social scientists about semiotics. And semiotics is, is, is often defined as a science of signs, but also it's a, it's a, it's a science of, of, of meaning, how, how it is that meaning evolves, how, how, do, how do signs become meaningful. There's a great movie uh, the di Diving Bell and the, and the Butterfly, Does, has anybody seen that? It's a French movie, and the, and the main character in that is, is Jean-Dominique Falbi, and he was a writer for, I think, for a, a French fashion magazine. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure which one, I think L or one of the, the French fashion magazines. And he had a stroke. And as a result of the stroke, he lost almost all muscle control. So the only thing he could control were his, his facial muscles. So, and, and this is a, a syndrome that's called locked-in syndrome. Okay? And interestingly, the stroke did not affect his cognitive functioning. So he was fully aware of the world. He could, he, he could think his, his cognitive function wasn't, but he, but he had no way, or all his classical ways of communicating with others in the world were blocked by this locked in syndrome. And the, the movie, and, and it's actually a book that he wrote in collaboration with his, his attendant, his, and what they did is they actually developed a language around blinks. And so he learned to communicate with his therapist through blinks. And that allowed him to create a, uh, to write the book that, that actually the movie's based on. So he wrote this by communicating with the therapist but the semiotic problem is, well, how did they figure out how to communicate? One of the things, this is a basic illustration, that, you know, she's there, he's there, and he has something he wants to say, but he doesn't know how to say it. And so what does he do? He can't do anything but blink. He blinks. And the therapist has to think, well, what, okay, what does that mean? And so, and so they have to work together, and, you know, and, and, and it's a dynamic, so, you know, perhaps he said, you know, say, okay, let's, you know, simple code, let's just do binary, right? Yes and no. Okay, I'll ask you questions, and, you know, one blink means, you know, two blinks mean yes, or one blink means no, or, you know, what they can, and then they begin to work from there, but they have to construct a language, and that's, they're solving the semiotic problem. How to create a symbol system 
so that we know what each other, we can communicate meaning. We can, we can ground the meaning. Yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, classically, semiotics has two classical roots. And one of those roots is Ferdinand de Saussure. And most of cognitive science comes out of the Saussure uh, tradition. And Saussure, Saussure was primary, and, and it's because Saussure's tradition really grew into the science of linguistics. And Saussure, one of his main driving curiosities was about the nature of alphabets and language. How is it that arbitrary shapes on a page like CAT come to be meaningful to people in terms of a specific animal? And so he was interested in how that, and, and, for, and so he was very interested in how symbols, how people use symbols to convey meaning. And so it's very much on language, and that, that was the focus of linguistics, which became a very important early computer science and cognitive science in terms of the development of computers as not analog devices, not analog computers, not perceptrons, but in terms of symbol processing machines. Okay, and, and so this became the basis for a lot of the, the, the computer metaphor and cognition, this idea. And a key aspect of Ferdinand Saussure is that meaning happens where? So CAT, what gives meaning to CAT? The object being different. Not for Saussure. There is no object. There is only CAT. Okay. It's what? What? It's user. Yeah, it's user. It's perception. So, so if if you understand English, if you understand the English alphabet, and you know how to read, then then you CAT. The meaning comes from what you know in your head. That you impose the meaning. But if you come from a different culture and you don't know English and you don't know the English alphabet, for Saussure, CAT is meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. It's, it's meaning depends upon what's in your head. And so for Saussure, meaning means interpretation. So if you, if you know English, or at least alphabet of English, if you have uh, some way to uh, connect the, you know, uh, the, the symbols to whatever perception you have for the symbols. If you don't know English, you don't know the alphabet, um, either you come to learn of the alphabet and then, you know, associate with the perception or um, uh, it's just not, you know, the, the two things will otherwise not connect. Right, right. If you don't know the rules of the language, it's meaningless. You can learn the rules of the language and it becomes meaningful, but if you don't know the rules, it's, in Saussure's view, it's meaningless. But you can translate. <laughs> yeah, well, so, Peirce, who was an American, formulate independently formulate semiotics in a different frame. And Peirce wasn't focused so much on language. Okay, Peirce was a, a, a functional psychologist, he was a, coll a colleague of William James, and the problem that Peirce was interested in is how our beliefs about the world, based on snippets of information that we acquire through experience and stuff, lead to successful action in the world. Okay. How did my beliefs about how, how did the, how did, how did the, for example, the Wright brothers' beliefs about flying translate into a successful flight? How did they come, their, their belief about how we would fly and what would it take to fly, how did that come to actually satisfy the conditions that led to successful flight? That's what Saussure was interested in. And, and that's a, that, that's a triadic view because in that example of, well, let's go back to, to, to Balbé and his service. So, for Saussure, he would be interested in is how the therapist attributed meaning to the blinks and how Balbé attributed meaning to the blinks. And, and you know, one of the things that, that led a lot of people to make Saussure's view intuitive was the individual differences. So, you know, one person may think the blinks mean yes, or, you know, what, he might be just itching his eye and, and have one mean, and the therapist might interpret that as a yes, when he was actually just flinching, right? So different people can look at exactly the same thing and have different meanings, and so it made sense that meaning was on the head of the observer. Okay, but what, what, Saussure, what, what Peirce was interested in 
is how the therapist understands what Balbi means. How they come into alignment. So what, what Peirce was interested in is how our beliefs of the world about how the world is come into alignment with how the world actually is. So, so for Peirce, Peirce was really interested in what's on the other side of the cat. You know, why CAT for representing this animal? Why not DOG for that animal? You know, what is it, what is it, what is it about the conditions, the symbols, how do those relate to the environment? So this is just a, a way of representing. So for, so sir, it's a symbol processing. There's a symbol here, and you start with CAT, and the question is, is what does that mean to this person? Okay, for purse, you have CAT, but he's interested in what did that mean to that person and how he responds to that object. How does he associate that with an object in the world? In the world? So if, if, if he, wa he wants to know how is it that if, if my wife calls and tells me to get cat food, I don't come home with dog food, right? That I interpret that in the correct way and do the actions that are appropriate. And so you not only have to have the coherence, it not, it not only has to be current, I know, need to know the, the, how the language works and how the alphabet works, but I also, it's important that that language maps onto the world in a way so that it leads me to do the appropriate behaviors in the right situations. So, so does it also talk about abstract uh, things like uh, if, uh, if there is uh, the only pet you have is cat and uh, uh, there is a phone call telling that to okay, get uh, pet food. So you interpret it to be uh, cat yeah. Food. So. And the other aspect that you have to understand, and, and, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, is that Peirce's view of semiotics was contextualized in his philosophy, which was pragmatics. Mm -hmm. And so for Peirce, he didn't care about any absolute truth or following rules. What he wanted to know is, did you bring the right food home? Okay, and, and so the, the only test of an idea is not how well you follow the rules, but whether you survive. So, so it's not that you, you know, so the, the test is not whether you, you know, conform to all the specifications that a good pilot should do. The test is, does the airplane land safely? And that's the only, in Peirce's mind, that's the only test of the validity of your beliefs. If your beliefs lead to success in the world, and, and he would argue that that's the only information you have about your beliefs. That's the only basis you have that an animal has, but the humans have, to judge whether their beliefs about the world are right is to do my behaviors. So, you know, talk about human interaction. Do I trust you or not? Is my trust warranted or not? Well, the only way I can tell whether that trust is warranted is by trusting you, we lead to successful collaborations or successful interactions. If my trust leads to unsuccessful, <laughs> if you cheat me or take advantage of me, then my belief is proven wrong. But there's no, the only test, and in a pragmatic system, the only test is do the actions, does the system survive? Does it, does it continue to work? If, if, the, if the beliefs are incongruent, then that's similar to pilot induced oscillations. The system's gonna, your wife's gonna shoot you if you keep coming home with dog food when she's asking you for cat food. You know, you don't, the marriage doesn't, you know, you might survive, but the marriage doesn't survive, right? <laughs> okay, so, and, and so, the key so thing just, is... I just want to add something uh, for thinking for, uh, you know, this particular group. So, in the more modern information theory, though, uh, we, we add something interesting. We add the agreement between the people and uh, document, right? So, we, when we do ontology design or, you know, uh, ontological commitment, um, in some sense, tries to um, uh, record agreement among the people for, about the pragmatics, about the real world. So, as opposed to um, having a single person, you know, associating the meaning to the object or whatever uh, you, need, you know you are interested in, here you are you creating a referent that is an agreement among the. People and that that made something interesting. I don't I don't know how to change the diagram or something, but that is quite related. When you know. Yeah. Well, actually, here's one way to think about changing the diagram to, to address that kind of kind of thing. And, and so so just you know in, in the way that 
much of early information processing cognitive science was set up is, again, the idea based on Saussure that what we, this is simple processing. So in the laboratory, we create the stimuli, we shoot them into the person, and then we look at trying to derive the transfer functions for the perceptual box and the decision box and, and the action box. Okay? And everybody realizes it's a closed loop system, but one of the key things that experimental psychologists have been taught, cognitive psychologists, is to break the loop in the, in the laboratory because you don't want the person's actions, you want total control of the stimulus. You don't want the human, the, the, the subject and participant to control the stimulus. You, as experimenter, want complete control of the stimuli so you can draw inferences about the relationship between what comes out this side and what went in this side. If you let the person look wherever they want, then you don't actually know what they saw. Now the person is determining what the stimulus is, not you. And so this made a lot of sense in the context of Saussure's semiotics and also in the, the computer metaphor where what you were trying to do is understand the nature of the simple processing of the rules inside the system. I, I, just, I just have to defend cognitive science here for a minute. I, I think you're correct that they have partitioned the problem in this way, but I don't think that the discipline thought that there wasn't any such thing as a real world. What they thought is that it made sense to study the symbol processing independently yes. of the interaction between the symbols and right. the world. And, and, yeah. and, and, and if that, you look at physical symbol systems, which is Newell 1981 and Unified Theories of Cognition, he's very clear about this point. I don't agree with him, but, but he is very clear. Those processes exist, he just thinks that it's sensible to study the right. one and, half. And what we're saying yeah. is, given the dynamics of closed-loop systems, that is nonsensical. Yeah. It doesn't make sense because the, there are dynamics at the level of the whole that get completely missed when you break up. And, and Per said this explicitly. This, this triad, the semiotic triad, has properties that can never be discovered in terms of any of the di dyads. And what, we, what we've kind of, and, I'll, and I'll, again, I'll address that in a second. But, in, in Ahmed, with regard to your point, so, you know, one of the things that the semiotic problems that computer scientists want to solve is you've got software that has certain functionality. And you've designed it with that functionality. And now somebody comes down and sits with the computer and going to use their, your software. For that to have, be a successful interaction, they have to understand what you meant and, and how to act and what are the expectations and how this thing works. Okay, and you know, computers are complicated devices and you know and, and so how you know storing and encoding information and information theory and stuff, do the users have to understand all that? And what the way one way that we solved it was the desktop metaphor. And this terms of metaphor, you create a representation and that representation, for that metaphor to work, it has to have two things. It has to reflect in terms of people's awareness. That is, their intuitions about how to move things around, move folders, and put things inside of things, have to be consistent with the way the computer actually works inside. They don't have to know how the computer works inside, but they have to have a belief system that's consistent with that. And so the, the success of the desktop metaphor is because that metaphor captures much of the dynamics that you want to do with computers in terms of storing and nesting information within other things. So it maps well to the problem space and it also maps well to the intuitions so that the people's intuitions about how the computer works, about how to move things on their desktop, and this is the essence of a good metaphor. It has to have a structural relationship to the problem, the target, interacting with computers that you want people to, to solve, but it also has to have a, a mapping into people's intuitions, and that mapping has to be consistent in a structural way. Okay, this is how, you know, so the desktop metaphor is, is one way, and, and the desktop metaphor dramatically transformed computer sciences from something that only the geeks or the scientists or the, to something that could be useful in the kitchen, could be useful as a publishing device and things, because the metaphor solved the semiotic problem. It made sure that the beliefs that the user had was consistent with the functionality that was actually in the machine. Okay? So, you know, the, the key, 
And here's where the key point is, is what the classical way, the assumption of null, and, and by the way, this is not just Null's assumption. I mean, this is not just psychology assumption, but this is a general assumption of all Western culture, is that mind and matter are different things. And the idea was that, you know, the semiotics, how you went from symbols to interpretation, that was the semiotic, the psychology problem. But the relationship between the symbols and the world, that was the physics, chemistry, biology, or the engineers have to worry about how the airplane actually works, and the computer scientists have to worry about know how the computer works, and the psychologist knows how the mind works, and the, the assumption is that then when we want to build a piece of software, we just get the computer, the psychologists together with the engineers, and we put the pieces together, and they'll predict what this dynamic's like. Did that happen often? No. And, and in fact, I mean, all, no, I don't think there's any example really where that's happened. You know, what happens is, is designers innovate, and then computer science and psychology comes around and tries to explain why it worked. I guess, uh, just one thing, I guess Melissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo, has already have a degree in psychology and uh, with an intersection of computer science. So she is, uh, like, specialized in, in this HCI kind of uh, intersection between psychology and computer science. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, there are, there are people who embody this, but, but there's also philosophy, and the implication going back always to William James is saying, no, these are not two separate ontologies. That there's only one ontology. And that ontology spans this. That meaning is not interpretation. Meaning is, the, the test of meaning is whether the interpretation corresponds with the world in a way that leads to successful action. So, so the cat, even though you don't know the language of England, of English, when somebody in English says cat, it's meaningful. Whether you understand it or not, it is meaningful. There's a basis for the meaning. It may not be, you may not be able to interpret the meaning, your interpretation, your guesses about what it means may be completely wrong. But if the meaning of the word does not depend on what's in your head. So it's an argument of analytical philosophy kind of. But analytic philosophy kind of. Well, this is, this is down to the metaphysics. So this is, you know, and again, Western science has treated all the way back to Descartes. Mind is logical, you know, and machines, you know, thinking is logical, and then there's the physical sciences. And, you know, it translates emotions, that's part of the body, so, you know, motion with respect to cognitive systems is noise. Well, we now know from neuroscience, from Damasio's work and stuff, that effective action in the world, effective decision in the world depends critically on emotional components. You can't separate, but you cannot, and so what we're saying, so, so far, both, these are two ways of saying the exactly the same thing. When we're talking about the dynamics of circles in terms of control systems, when we talk about the semiotic triad, we're saying exactly the same thing. The intuition is exactly the same. The whole has properties, emergent properties, that can never be understood if you only look at the pieces independently. There's a dynamic at the whole level. A cognitive system is a relationship. It's a duel between people and their, eco and their ecology. It's not something that happens in, inside people's heads. It happens in the process of interacting with the world. Um, I would argue that uh, meaning is associated to the concept. For instance, cat, the concept of the cat says, some, is something which is well known to anybody with any language. Then, actually, we associate the, that actually letter, that symbols from English or any other language to that concept. You know what I mean? That's yeah. I mean, so so, so the, that concept yeah. is meaningful, not that cat's words. Well, so there there certainly has to be a distinction. We've talked about it before between the lexical item, yeah, and the and the concept. They're not the same thing. Yeah. That's that's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. And I don't think that's yeah. gonna be but I mean but that's that's one of the problems in communication both within psychology and across psychology and computer science is what do people mean when they say it's meaningful? So, yeah. so when so and and for many people when they say it's meaningful, they mean I know how to interpret it. And that's the dyadic view. Okay? If you take the triadic view, when you say something's meaningful, you say it has significant implica functional implications for success. 
And those are two different things. I think so. I so think for computer no, scientists, we only take the latter. I don't think much of uh, computer science will be interested in the former. In well, you you I you mean, watch, and people slip. And in the in the common language, the the first is what most people mean. It's interpretable. Hmm. In linguistics, and, yes. But but no. it sneaks in. It sneaks in. It's it's what? it's it's throughout cognitive science that so you can find lots of examples where people treat because it. Because much of computing that we do is to uh, get uh, action. Uh, to you know, to yeah. to result yeah. into physical action or well, whatever well, decision making. So so clearly we we care, but I, I do take issue with this notion that linguists are totally divorced from environments. All no. of conversation analysis is yeah, yeah, about no, there's, there are how linguists yeah, who do it that way. Environment. I mean, Lakoff and Johnson are, are critical Lakoff examples and, of, of who and, the, and Jack of who and, this and is. Tommy and yeah uh, yeah 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 no no yeah a lot of people yeah a lot of people that so the tr and I would argue that to try to Tradition semiotics is, is getting more and more important, and and, and uh, it takes us to the next idea of abduction. But but I would say historically, computer scientists became interested in the triadic view of semiotics and and the process of abduction when they started building robots instead of desktop computers. Okay, I have one question, and if you think it is digression, then you can make sure. that. So where do you put logic into all this? So in logic, we use symbols, but we reason in terms of all models and things of that sort, right? So we separate. Okay, that's the next point. Oh, that's okay. exactly. So that's abduction. And so first, the, the father tried to view argued that the way reasoning works, logic works in the real world, is through abduction, not induction or deduction, not the formal methods. And can I just make one one point because there's a lot of younger students here. So I just I just want to make sure that we understand why this is important for the work that we're doing. At least for hazard Cs and harassment and, and GBV, people are saying things about the world. And so we need to understand that relationship between what they're saying and the conditions in the world. That's what we're trying to infer when we try to mine social media. So let's look at logic. Let's look at a classic problem in logic. So this is a, the book, bag, and poker chip experiment. Does anybody know this book, bag, and chip, poker chip experiment? Good, so I'll tell it to you. So we can, we can do it on you. Okay, so I have two book bags in my office. And one has 70% red chips. So 70 red chips, 30 blue chips. The other has 70 blue chips and 30 red chips. So the one with mostly red we'll call the red book bag. And the one with mostly blue we'll call the blue book bag. I go and pick one. What's the probability? What's the likelihood it's a red bag? Half. Half. Fifty percent. Okay. Now I have this bag, so fifty percent. Now I reach in, and I pull out a red chip. Now, how confident are you that it's a red bag? So does that improve your? How now? How now? How confident? So it was 50% confidence red bag. Now what? What's your confidence? 50%. So 70 is 50. Two thirds. I think it's two thirds. Is a bag? It is. is a I reached in is. and pulled out a red chip. Just one bag of red chip. Okay. So you? some of you are saying like 51, 52, maybe. No. Some say 70. No. Yeah. No. It's the same. It's the same. The bag. If you're talking bag, it is the same. If you're talking about chips, it's different. No. No. It turns out. 45. It. it 45? Less? You're less confident it's a red book bag after I reached in and pulled out a red chip? So, so it turns out we have rules for, for how to figure out this normatively, and this is an example of Bayes' theorem. So, if, and it turns out that according to Bayes' theorem, if you pick that red, because it's much more likely you're going to pick red if the if the bag has 70% chunk, you should increase your confidence. And it should go up to like 70%. So you're right. So, so most, you know, when I particularly when I do this in a psychology class, they'll say, well, well maybe 51% or not ah, still 50% or 52 But people tend to be very conservative. And they don't revise their estimates. But if you, if you draw two red in a row, and this is with replacement, two is up to 84%. Three ninety-three percent, and and, and this, this again. This is the this is the ideal, the optimal 
rules for adjusting your uh, estimates based on the information that's acquired with each, each sample. Okay, and when we do this experiment uh, with humans, again, their function looks, you know, just a little bit, but it's really shallow. And this is evidence while well, humans are, you can't compute base theorem in their head, and they're, they're conservative, they anchor on the first adjustment, and they don't advise it, so it's considered to be a bias. Okay. Well, Peirce looked at the real world and, and looked at these, and, you know, and, the, and this is a question for much of, much of decision-making rationality. It takes things like Bayes' theorem, gives them a problem that Bayes' theorem can solve precisely, gives it to humans, and guess what? Humans don't do it as well. Humans are suboptimal, right? And so, and so much of cognitive psychology is trying to explain why humans... So limited memory, limited computation capacity, the, the, you know, workload, it's, there's some reason that we need to explain why humans are, are not as well as they should be given the rules. But Peirce suggests that, well, in real life, the problem is more like this. There's a, so I, so there's, well, I won't read this to you, I'll just, I'll just tell, it to you, tell you. So here's, the, here's another problem. I have a bunch of book bags in my office. I'm not actually sure how many. And some of them have, and I, there are all kinds of colored chips, and most of them are relatively mixed, but there's one with all blue, and there's one with red, and you know, and some of them have more blue than others and things. So I, I pick a bag. What's the probability it's a blue bag? Bayes' theorem does not help you in this one problem. But you don't know what n is. The number of bags. Yes, but you don't know how many bags. I can't, I don't, I don't know. I haven't even counted them. But you can't estimate. You can't. You can't apply. Bayes' theorem does not help you in this situation. Okay? And so, and, and what this is, Peirce argues, in the real world, there's all these uncertainties and things. So, so these computations and these closed, nice problem where I give you all the probabilities and I tell you and I find these, you can apply these normative rules. But in the real world, so, you know, when you picked the school to go to graduate school. How did you determine the right state was the best place to come? You know, how, many, how many schools were there? How many options do you have? And what's the probability that you'll be successful in the right state relative to the probability you'd be successful at MIT or Caltech? Or How do you know that? How many people survived? You know, did you do statistics on how, what the graduation rate is in the different countries? Compare them and comply Bayes' theorem and, and go to the graduate school that was the best? Would it have made sense to do that? I mean, did you even have the numbers that will allow you to do that? And, and the thing is, is most problems in the real world are this way. You know, you're going to buy a house and things are going on the market, dynamic, there seems, most of them are picking a mate, you know, picking a wife, deciding whether to have children or not. You know, almost all the decisions in the real world don't satisfy the conditions to allow us to do norm, to apply normative models like Bayes' theorem. And so, and so to start from there is not a very good way to understand what, what Peirce is basically arguing with abduction is to start from there is not a good place. That people, there's huge uncertainties. But let me, let me illustrate this further. This is, this is a classic experiment. This is a waste and task. And there, again, this is representative of the kind of experiments that this is based on. And so here's a, here's a rule that applies to these. If there's a vowel on the letter side, then there's an odd number on the number side. Okay, and your job as a subject is to turn over the fewest number of cards possible to determine whether the rule is true or not. What cards would you turn over? Is it well, obvious? There are fewer vowels, right? A. So first. Turn over A. First two and last two. Yeah, after the other one should... You turn them over all? I turn no, no, the last second. one. Turn over yeah. four? Turn over, yeah, turn the four. So How many would want to see what's on the back of five? What is it because the back of... Okay. But if odd number is on the, the other side, it doesn't tell me yeah, that it it's, it doesn't, it's yeah. not yeah. F and okay. only F. Good. You guys, you guys are good. Yeah. So here's the same problem. Here's a similar problem. So this is a table 
where I have people drinking beer and different drinks. And the rule is, if this table is legal, then if, if alcohol, they have to be over 21. And you know, this person's drinking alcohol, this person's non-alcohol, you can, you know that this person is over 21, it's pretty obvious. Okay, this is a, the same problem. Okay, and similar. Which cards would you have to turn over to tell whether that's a legal table? Beer and? So on one side is what they're drinking and the other side the age. Yeah, so you've got to see what's on the other side of, of 16. So beer and 16 for that. So here's the thing. So suppose your hypothesis was if there's life in the water, your hypothesis is if there's life in the water, in, in, if there's life on a planet, then there has to be water. If you wanted to test that hypothesis, what cards would you have to turn over? So this is the contra positive answer. Yeah, so you'd have to turn over which card? No water. And life. life and no water. Okay, so yeah, so here's the answers. So you know, turn so when you give this a, a large something like 30% of the people choose A and 5. Okay, but the actually you guys were right. The right answer is A and four, because five, the odd number, can be have a vowel or a consonant on the other side. So, but if the even number doesn't have a consonant on the other side, then it violates the rule. And then so you can prove the rule wrong. But you know, if you turn over five uh, and and find uh, a vowel on the other side, you could do that a million times, and that wouldn't prove the rule right. So you, and, and this is in, in induction problems, you can never prove the rule in an in induction system. You can prove a rule wrong, but you can never prove a rule true. So an infinite number of results consistent with your hypothesis doesn't prove your hypothesis, but one contradiction is enough to disprove it. It turns out when we put it in this context, almost everybody gets it right. But I mean... But, this thing about but, one contradiction, isn't that also applied in, um, for example, classical, you know, in the frame logic and other things? Yes, yeah, this, yeah, is, this is coming out of classical logic. Yeah, yeah this is true of classical logic. And, but, and here's the thing. In this, people don't perform consistently with the logic. We change the context, and from the point of view of logic, these are isomorphic. These are exactly the same problem. People always get this one right. Only half of the people get this one right. For people, context matters. Why did they get it right here? Okay, and, and one hypothesis is, is, is because, is, and it turns out that when you frame this in terms of per permission, so if you, in order to get this privilege, you have to do this. So in order to have the privilege of drinking alcohol, you have to be a certain age. And you can make it very abstract. So it can be this, culture that nobody knows about where in order to eat cookies you have to have a blue hat on they'll get it right so as long as it's framed in terms of permission why and and the hypothesis is that we have schemas about about permission because it's very important in a society that requires cooperation that that you you create rules for people to follow in order to get the benefits of society but there's always going to be cheaters my, my, who want the benefits but don't follow the rules. So you need to be able to detect cheaters, and you are very good at detecting cheaters. But you're not very good at logic, inductive logic, when it's in the abstract. Yeah. Well, what, what do you think about the following uh, hypothesis that um, uh, people, uh, general public or general, general person, uh, has a lot more uh, context about uh, social con you know, this yep. beer and coke has a little bit more of a social thing. The other one is mathematics or no, that's exactly uh, right. Thing. I mean, no, but and so within uh, you know because they have a lot more of the context um, uh, or a, 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 a relevant knowledge, uh, they can create the context much better and uh, address this problem better than the one where yes, you have much less. Yes, because humans are abductive. They're grounding. They're solving problems that are grounded in the world. And you take them out of that world, they're not going to be so good. Normative models of mathematics are context independent. Humans are not. But here's, here's, the real, uh, here's the really important one. So if you're the director of NASA, where are you gonna send your, when are you, where are you gonna send your probes into the universe? There is 
What are you trying to accomplish as the director of NASA? That there is a life. Something you want to discover life. Yeah. Okay, you don't care about the, whether it's true or not. You want to find life. So where are you going to send your spaceships? Where you think there's water. Right? That's not going to test your hypothesis. If you find life in water, that doesn't prove that water is required for life. It's not about poop. And this is what abduction is about. This is what Peirce is saying. Per, Peirce is saying that common sense and reasoning, rationalizing the world is not about truth as an absolute. It's about finding life in the universe. It's about finding food. It's about finding mates. And so what a, the way an abductive system is, is you have hypothesis about where life is likely to be, and your actions, searching the universe, it makes sense for those to direct your actions. Okay? It's not about truth, it's about pragmatics, it's about success. The, your only test of your beliefs about the world is how well they work. And things that work lead to hypothesis, and those hypotheses direct your actions. And it, of course, if you learn new things based on those actions, you get feedback to, to suggest that your beliefs are wrong. So you take dog food home and your wife gives you hell. Then that's feedback and you adjust and you say, oh, okay, now I know what you want the next time, right? Because you change your beliefs. But that's what, that, again, that's a closed loop system. It's a pragmatic system. That's abduction. And, and so the, the, the key argument is, is that reasoning in cognitive system, naturalistic reasoning, is about, not about truth. It's not about the things that are important to the mathematicians or the logicians. It's about, does it work? So your computer doesn't, you know, your computer be behaves crazy. And most of us, you guys might want to know why it's not working. But most of us, if we turn it off and turn it back on and it works, we're happy with that. And we don't care why it works. The key is, the test of that belief is, does it work? And as long as it works, we're going to do it. And we're going to believe in it. You know, when we turn it on and turn it off and it still doesn't work, then we call our colleague in computer science and say, help! But, but as long as it works, you, that's the only test of your belief. That's the only basis for determining the validity in the real world. I have a question, actually. Um, is it the plausible that rules violating each other? I mean, so yes, the world is complex and contradictory. And, 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 so, and then that's the thing is, you know, the world, and not only do they, they violate each other, but the world is dynamic. So the things that, so for example, the strategies that you use to be successful in high school or as an undergraduate, that's going to lead to hypothesis about what it takes to be a successful graduate student. And most of you will discover very early in your graduate careers that those strategies that really work to get to A's as an undergraduate are not the things that are important to my, the faculty of the graduate program. They don't care about my class grades, so their class grades are irrelevant. What they want to know is how productive am I in the laboratory? And my research, where's your creativity, where's your generativity? Are you coming out with new ideas? But, but, you know, so we're constantly, as the world's constantly changing, and so we create hypotheses, we act on the hypotheses that have worked in the past at first, but then they either work or not. We get, we have consequences, those actions have consequences. And those consequences then allow us to adjust our hypotheses to conform to the new situations. And, then, and that's the point, is there are no absolute rules. There's no, you know, absolute number of book bags. I don't know how many book bags, I don't know, you know, so this is not a rule-based system. This is an, an, a dynamic, this is a feedback system. This is a self-organizing system. It's acting on the environment, it's using the information, feedback from those actions as, as the task of the hypothesis of those actions, and then it's either keeping the hypothesis if those actions are satisfying and leading to success, or if the results of acting on those beliefs are not satisfying, then I adjust my beliefs. So one more last point I want to talk about, another angle. Again, it's all, each one I'm saying exactly the same thing, but we're just looking at it from a different angle. And, and this angle is from representation. And this is based on early research by Gestalt psychologists. And, and one of the classical problems is a traveling monk problem. And some of you may have heard of this. The, the problem is this. This monk wakes up at dawn, 
and at the base of, in his temple at the base of the mountain, and he travels up to the top of the mountain to meditate and pray, and it takes him all, all day to get up the mountain. He starts at sunrise, he reaches the top at sunset. There's only one narrow path up the mountain. He's up at the mountain for three days, he prays and meditates, and then on the fourth day at dawn, he gets up and starts down the mountain. And he takes exactly this, he follows that path that he went up the mountain. And the question for you is, on those two trips, is there any place, is there any time of day where he's at the exact place on the trail on the two trips? Exact place? Exact same place at the exact same time of day on the two trips. No, I don't. At dawn, I mean, you say? Assuming the, you know... No, because at dawn he's at the top for one trip and he's at the bottom for the other trip. Yeah, probably. Mm. Yeah. So you say no? It depends. If, if the speed is... Speed, speed varies, speed. something, he, you know, going up, he's, he's on average maybe a little bit slower, but he gets, you know, he, he rests, he eats his lunch along the way and stuff. If you assume that the speed is same going up and down, then... No, it's not the same. same. It's yeah. different. You can't assume that. It depends, yeah. So, so... So like okay, yes, yes. so here's another problem. Well, actually, before I tell you this, let, let, let me, well, let me, let me tell you. So I gave this to a cognitive science class, one of my first classes I taught here at Wright State, and I gave the students a week to work on the problem. And midway through the week, the student goes, my knock, my knock, 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 duck, flack, duck, flack. He says, God, I was working on a problem and I couldn't figure it out. He said, but yesterday, I was going to see my father at my parents' house, and he, oops, he was coming to see me at the same time. And I knew the answer. What did he know? So, at the end of the week, I, all the students are there, and I asked them, well, how many can prove that it's actually, he, yes, he will be at the same place at the same time. And a number of people raised her hand, and uh, a woman, I said, how did you prove it? And she said, well, I made a graph. And I said, okay, well, show, show the classic graph. And this is, this is what I expected her to do. And this is, so this is a classic solution. So the first trip, sun, sunrise, he starts up the mountain, and at sunset, he's at the top, right? And again, the, the slope is, you know, speeding up and slowing down. He takes the trip down, all different speeds. Starts at the top, he ends up at the bottom at sunrise. So bottom, top, sunrise. Ends. Is there any way that I can connect these corners without their lines intersecting? What's the intersection? The intersection means at the same place at the same time. The casting. But that's not what she drew. This is what she drew. And she, and I'm like, what? This, this is what you drew. And I'm like, wait, how, how do you explain? How does that work? And she said, well, did you say the path spiraled up the mountain? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, this is the top and this is the bottom. And I said, yeah, but how does that prove it? And she said, well, I put one finger here and one finger here, and I moved them at all different speeds, and they always ran into each other. <laughs> so it had to be at the same place. The same. So she created a simulation. And what did that guy know? So suppose I gave you this problem. Suppose at dawn there's two monks, one at the top of the mountain and one at the bottom. And they both, and the bottom, at, at, this, at, at dawn, one starts up and one starts down. They walk along the same path. Will they meet? What does that mean to me? But that does not uh, ask for a particular place and particular time in the same time. No, but I never asked. I never asked. I didn't ask for a particular time. You can't predict where, but you can say absolutely that it has to be true that they will meet. And, and so... No, this, when you say same time, that means it should, they should... Have at the same time. place at the same time. What is this? Same place, same time on two trips. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, and you know, so what this this is this comes from classical re research of Gestalt psychologists, and what they want to illustrate 
And again, this is how context matters, that representations matter. So if I give you the problem in the original form, it's complicated, and it's difficult, and it's hard for you to make sense. But if I give it to you in the last form of two monks, instead of one monk and two different days, and ask if they meet, it's obvious. Just a shift in representation. And, and in fact, I mean, the simplest representation is this. It doesn't matter that it's going up the mountain. It doesn't matter it spirals. It's a line. It's two point two. It's essentially, if you take a trip this way and that way on the line, there has to be a point where they're going to be at the same place in the same time. There's no way past it. The points have to meet. The, the monks have to meet. It doesn't matter whether they're different days. As long as you're using the same time index, it's exactly the same. So representations matter. And, and again, this gets back to that idea of metaphor. You know, when we're building, so the, whether a metaphor is good, whether a desktop metaphor works, it has to be something that's understandable to people. So it has to be a representation that makes the solution intuitive to them, but it has to capture the essence of the problem. Okay, and this is the idea that this is the essence of the problem. This adds a lot of extra things that you don't need there. This adds a lot of extra things that you don't need. And in fact, in the verbal description I gave you, added lots of extra things that you didn't need. They kind of hid the underlying structure. Okay? And, and part of our job, in, in terms of building ontologies and building interfaces so people can get the most out of our software, is to understand what the essence, the essential things are, and communicate those in a way that is going to make sense to the people using it. And again, that's the, that's the idea of metaphor. That, that, and again, the desktop metaphor is because moving things on the desktop on the screen made sense to the cook in the kitchen and, and the writer, as well as the computer scientist. Yeah? So, uh, this, what I can map this to is probably uh, in a lot of our projects, we are trying to model context. Uh, so, and uh, we try to look at a lot of information. So probably this kind of idea is more important that we have to identify the things which can actually mislead us. Yes, that's right. That's right. And, 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 and that's the, the triadic. You, you know, you know, you have to understand what's the problem. What's the problem I'm trying to solve? What are the constraints in terms of? So if it's flying airplanes, you got to understand aerodynamics. If it's if it's you know if it's uh, uh, using a, a database, a medical database, in a, in a meaningful way, then you have to understand how the information in that database is organized. And that has to be organized in a way, if that database is not organized in a way that makes sense to the doctor, they're going to have a hard time finding what they need in that database. So we have to know, and, and it, but, but it also has to make sense not only in terms, particularly if it's guiding decisions, it also has to make sense in terms of effective treatment to the patient. So not, not only what the doctor believes, but it also has to work. And, and again, medicine's an art, so a lot of things doctors believe may not be true. And so part of our job is to help them have more effective representations. And, and that's actually where we're working right now. And, and I was going to give a demonstration of this, but I think since we're, are we, we're going to quit at 4.30? Or 5.30? So um, I'm just going to skip to the end, and, and if, if you want to uh, if people want to stick around, I have actually an iPad application of this, the dynamics of this. And this, this is for helping physicians make decisions about cardiovascular disease and, and how, building representation that we think is an effective decision aid. But I, I just want to conclude in, in the main, so get back to the four points. You know, again, these are different threads, but they all, I think, have exactly the same implications for cognition. The co cognitive systems are self-organizing systems. And that means that there are properties at the level of the human, the, the person, problem, ecology, interaction that have to be understood at the level of the interaction that can never be understood independently. So you can't understand the meaning of CAT. To really understand the meaning, you've got to understand what's in the person's head who's reading it and what is behind the, you know, what is it representing the world. And, but much of the work in design from psychology and applied psychology has, has focused, has really evolved from this dyadic model. 
And so, you know, this is just kind of a list of what I think are kind of key implications. So the classical view is the norms for rationality come from the mathematical logic. So if, if you want to make effective decision makers, train them in logic, train them in economic theories, and Bayes' theorem, and treat them all those things. And when they make errors relative to that, then you correct those errors and, and, and you, you correct those errors by training them in logic. Okay, the alternative is ecological rationality, and the ecological rationality is the logic is grounded in the functional consequences. It's pragmatic, and people don't know how, have to know how computers work. They have to know how to do their work with the computer, and they there. And so you want to just you know, it's not about absolute truth. It's about does it work? That's the ultimate. That's the only test for ecological abductive systems. The nature of problems. Much of the research in cognitive science is based, and, and a lot of the early, you know, all the, the good old-fashioned AI, these were little puzzles. These were closed systems. All the variables were specified. These were puzzles, playing tic-tac-toe. And, and, but it gets, as soon as it gets complicated, as soon as you start getting to the level of chess, and you get to the level of conversation, you get to the level of uh, medical decision-making, a lot of the classical AI approaches break down. So despite a lot of work, we don't have computers deciding on, on important medical problems for us. Um, in the real world, things are open. They're ill-structured. Ill they're analytically intractable. I mean, most of the, the interesting kind of is, you're, you know, picking a, a mate, picking a house, picking a graduate school, deciding when to buy, you know, deciding where to invest your retirement funds. These are ill-defined, messy problems, and we don't have all the variables and things, and so it takes a lot of, a lot of guesswork and, and hypothesis. The implication of, of this thing for humans is it focuses on those, the causes of those errors, those deviations from the math, predictions of mathematical logic. So much of human factors and design has been to protect the smart computers from the stupid humans who are using them. And, and you know, it's a classical engineer. My system would be perfect, Except for the human users don't, you know, my software works perfectly, but then when you put the human in there, they don't, they're stupid, they don't know how to use it. And that's a classic, that's a classical way, it's the idea of human factors is to characterize those limitations, limitations of memory, except from plus or minus two, so the engineers don't overwhelm them with too much information. Okay, the flip side of that though is this seven plus or minus two, and this is important in representations, if, if you read the original article, the end of the article is about Encode, recoding information. And the conclusion of the article is there is no functional limit to memory. Because people chunk, it's 7 plus or minus 2 chunk, but there is no limit in time with people, how much information people can integrate into a chunk. At least none's been discovered it, it yet. And so that's why a grandmaster can look at a chessboard and recreate all the positions based on a three second glance because he sees relationships, he chunks the information. And so, and so what, one of the things, and, and that's, that's, what, that's one of the key questions when you're trying to pick up a re design representations, is how to organize and chunk information so that lots of information, lots of variables can fit within the span of 7 plus or minus 2. 7 plus or minus 2 is not a functional limit on cognitive systems. In fact, some people are arguing that it's critical to have this limit because forgetting, it, it, it helps us to focus on the task. That, that, that most times success depends on two or three key variables and somebody who sees everything and knows everything and never forgets everything is at a handicap relative to somebody who can selectively focus. So it's actually seen as an asset. Some people believe it's an asset. In terms of the, the underlying semiotic system, this is based on dyadic, this is based on triadic. The nature of the design challenge, again classically it's to accommodate the human limitations. The alternative, our view, is, is to leverage human abilities, their abilities to sense make, their, their ability to abductively to generate hypotheses and test hypotheses through action is why we often want to get people in our systems to make the work. When, and, and so we believe that most complicated work gets done because of the human components in the system. Again, technology allows them to do things that they could never do without that technology. But the technology on its own is pretty, is, is not very intelligent in, in, the, in terms of making its way in the world. When, it, when, they ha when the 
when, when survival in the world becomes important. Uh, again, in terms of safety, uh, the classical view sees humans as a source of errors. The, the emphasis, the alternative view is, is humans create safety by workarounds and by, by creating solutions to problems that the designers of the automated systems didn't anticipate that happened because the world is not stationary. So when you design a piece of software, when you design a, a rule for doing something, you're making certain assumptions about how to fly, but then they change the dynamics of the aircraft and you go from propeller craft to jet, and, jet craft and those rules don't work anymore. And you have to adapt the system or you get <coughs> special conditions that weren't anticipated in the training or the design of these systems. It's the humans that end up making these systems work. Okay, this is the second to last slide. So, you know, This is the kind of the way we organize our sciences now. As we think about, so everybody knows so the intention first because, so there's the agent, there's the mind, and that's the social scientist's purview. And then there's the environment, the structure, database structures, computers, technology, as long as, and the physical environment over here. And, and that's the hard sciences. And, and we know that there's relationships that are important, like satisfying, specifying, and affording. But we think of these as ontologically derivative. These are not the basis of reality. These are the basis of reality. These are the real things. Okay, what we're arguing, and, and the, the main theme of our book, uh, What Matters, is that, this is, that, that when you go to a, mono, uh, a, a monistic, when you put mind and matter together, it means that these duals become the objects and then, in fact, we're arguing that you can't understand these pieces unless you understand the duals first. And those duals are satisfying. What is what, what will work? You have to understand what's functionally going to satisfy the job you're going to do. What, what does it take to, to succeed? Specifying what is the information that is necessary to know whether this is satisfying and to control this in a way that's going to get you to the goals that you need. And what are the, what are the, action, what are the action capabilities that are necessary in this world? And, and it's these things, it's satisfying what are the value system, specifying what kinds of information, and affording is what kind of action potential has to be there in order for this system to work. And none of those things can be, so none of these things can be answered based on one of these pieces. All of these things are duals across mind and matter. And we're arguing ontologically that if you have a, a science of cognition, these should be the objects, the basic objects. These duals are the basic objects, not the pieces in the puzzle over there. So a lot of things and a lot of things left out. If you're interested in this kind of way, we do our book, What Matters, and you can download it for free from Core Scholar. So um, it's available there. And, and what I tried to say in an hour and a half, this says in over 300 pages. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of things in between the cracks to, to connect all these things. But, but the key thing is, you know, this is not, this comes from many different directions. It's consistent with dynamical systems and control systems. Everything we know about the stability of self-organizing systems and how they work is consistent with, the, with, with what I'm saying. It's consistent with the triadic view, Peirce's view of semiotics, that, by the way, had a huge impact on the evolution of cybernetics and the development of control systems. And, and it has clear implications for how we design representations that make things work and, and how common sense in the world, rationality in, grounded in the world works as opposed to the abstraction of math, defined by the logicians and math, mathematicians defined for mathematical puzzles you know, when you have all the information and you have complete control of the situation. So. Um, so if you're interested, you know, so that book's there and, and downloadable and, and, uh, and free. Thank you. Thanks. So did any of that make sense? So uh, I have one other question which might look very philosophical in nature rather than <coughs> cognitive. So, do you see cognition as a as a property of life? If so, then
then how was the system before the life came in? I mean, how do we model the system before the life came in? Well, so what I see, the fundamental property is this closed loop. Okay. Okay. And it turns out, you know, so if you read the literature on chaos and dynamical systems, self-organizing system, so, you know, you have these chemical clocks, right, that behave in, that order emerges, and they behave almost as if they have brains. Yeah, so, so what I'm saying is, is anything that can adjust its behavior based on consequences of moving around the world is, is, a, is going to have these attributes. And you know, humans have, you know, what, what the unique thing about humans is we have enormous capacity to adjust and learn and, and adapt to the world. And it's our ability to adapt. There's a, there's a uh, anecdote about a, a, a plant, an ocean plant life. And this thing, in the early parts of its life, it moves around in the world. And then at some point it attaches itself to, uh, you know, to a piece of coral and then essentially for the rest of its life it's there. And it turns out that in the first phase this thing has a brain, a well-defined brain. When it attaches itself, it eats its brain. Because the, because the, the cost, the, the biological cost of the brain are, are not worth the, the, the benefits. And so, so the, the, but the key, the, the, the reason that anecdote is people use that is because it's saying that you know, what we need brains is because we move around in the world. We're moving around in the world. And, and it's action in the world. It's our capacity to move in the world that requires us then to adapt to the consequences of those actions. And if we go to a very limited set of actions, once we become a plant, the value of a brain, and, you know, plants do move. They follow the sun and stuff. But they're very primitive kinds of adaptions to the environment compared to, compared to what even, you know, single-cell animals do. And then, you know, multi-cell animals, when you start getting up to as you move higher in the final, the capacity, what changes is the capacity for adaptation. And all, all we're saying, when we say cognition, we're just saying, we're just acknowledge, I, you know, and, and attribute that to humans. I think we're just acknowledging that humans have a capacity for adaptation that many other animals don't. But I would say that even the simplest single cell animal that can adjust, you know, that, that is sensitive to chemical gradients and can find, seek out food and move and find a mate in its environment, I think that has cognition. And, and I would even argue that the you know, plant that can adjust itself to the sunlight has a, at least a very primitive form of, of cognition. I have a question actually. Uh, I acted that the human has a, a huge power of adaptation. But the point is that I always think that brain is very lazy to change. Yes. No, that, that, no we... we Again, that, that's actually true. So, all, you know, the test is success. And, we're late, and, and the question is, how important is success to you? And, and that, this, is, this gets back to, you know, uh, Simon's idea of satisfying. We don't, we don't want to work for the best. We want to work for whatever works. And we're satisfied with what works. That's part of our laziness, you know. If it works, if it gets us our degree, you know, we're not, we don't want to necessarily work harder than we have to. You know, we don't want to work as hard as Amit wants us to work. We want to get <laughs> just hard enough so Amit doesn't kick me out of the program, right? Yeah. No, no. But but you have different different people are going to work harder because they have different goals, and you know, and and, and so it, it depends upon your value system. But you know, if it's a high value, you're going to work hard. If it's low value, you're not going to spend much effort to get get there. You're going to be satisfied with less. You know, if you know, so you know, if my computer works. When I turn it off and turn it on and it fixes a problem, then I'm happy with that. I don't want to spend the effort to really go through and diagnose and understand why. That takes a lot of work. If it always works and just clicking on, I don't have to know. If that's all I need to know, that's all. I'm not a computer scientist. I don't care. All I want to do is get my work done and get my paper written. And so I want to, I want to, do, I want to think just hard enough to make things work. But, but the key thing is, is it's about making things work. It's about acting. And, and so that's, that goes back to... The uh, so a paper, it's you. Cognition is a way of connecting perception and action. That's it. In to make things work. That's all it is. It's not a magical thing. It's not something brains and anything that endures in life that that adjusts its behavior in order to per, to continue its existence. That's a cognitive system in my view. And 
all of them have, the key thing is it's got a sensor system, so it has feedback. It has some way of sensing and knowing about the world, and it has some capacity to act to adjust its behavior in the world. But perception action is what we're trying to understand. And cognition is an epiphenomenon that comes out of that dynamic. But breaking, you know, breaking into parts and saying you got perception here and you got cognition here and you got action here, that misses, uh, I think, that really leads to, to problems, contradictions. And what you need to do is treat the perception action dynamic holistically, and then you can have a better understanding of what cognition is for. But, but in that sense, uh, would you, you look at, for example, SOA makes perception as just one part of the cycle, uh, as one step in the cycle yes, of cognitive read, cycle. The, the first statement he says is you can't understand any of the components without understanding the perception action cycle. So it's, it's a question of, so if you look at his parts and say, okay, the way I'm going to understand this cycle is I'm going to pick this part, I'm going to understand this one, and then I'm going to do this part. If you take a reductionist approach, you'll never get there. I, that's my point, and that's what I think So is saying. Even though he, he gives you that, makes that decomposition, the point of saying that you have to see it in the context of the perception action circle is, is that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And when you break it into the parts, you destroy the dynamic that you're trying to understand. If you try to understand perception independent of action, you're going to ask really stupid questions about the perceptual system. If you try to understand action without understanding the information that's guiding that action, you're going to make very naive assumptions and naive conclusions about that action system. If you look at the decision making and without understanding the domain and the consequences of choices based on those decisions and the information that's driving those decisions, you're going to make very naive generalizations about that decision process. You cannot, if you, as soon as you cut that cycle, as soon as you cut that circle anywhere, it's like trying to discover life in a cadaver. You know, by cutting out, you know, if you want to find life by cutting the body apart, it's not going to happen because in the process of cutting it about, you actually destroy the phenomenon that you're looking for. And that's what all these points, what we're saying is, you know, that Peirce came to this conclusion, but the cybernetic hypothesis, the all the work on self-organizing dynamics, the underlying assumption is, is if you're interested in the dynamics of adaptation, behavior in the world, how things succeed in the world, you know, look at, look at natural selection. So, I mean, that's a funny, and, and by the way, that's what was driving Peirce. So, you know, Peirce and James were trying to build a psychology it was consistent with Darwin's idea of natural selection. So they saw cognition as a capacity for adapting to the world. Yeah, but uh, the recent argument of Harari about uh, natural selection that it's incidental and the rest of the people who could not, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of species got uh, eradicated because they could not adopt to the environment rather than there is some selection mechanism. Right, but there is no mechanism. Yeah, there is no mechanism. mechanism. No, there is no mechanism. The ones who survive are the ones who were fit in their environment. Yes. And and you could be the smartest person in your environment, but if if the conditions for your existence and you know, I mean one of the things again, you know, one of the things that that again, one of the anecdotes people use to kind of bring this home is, you know, if you eliminate all the humans on from the planet, the planet would go on almost un undisturbed. It would continue to evolve and stuff. If you eliminated insects from the planet, no one would survive very long. We'd all be dead eventually. The, the whole system would crash. And, and so, so, you know, the, the highest, the, the most adaptable system can get wiped out by something like global warming. And the insect, and, and the, the smallest organism that's really kind of well-tuned to its <coughs> narrow niche could survive. It's not a, you know, you know, it's, 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 there's two things. And you can't look at the organism and say, oh, this organism is so smart that it's, you know, this idea of thinking of man as a pinnacle of evolution is a mistake. You know, we're just the people who are left over. You know, we're just what's left over because of some, you know, meteor hitting the earth at a certain time and stuff. You know, there's no... You know, and there's lots of animals existence or out there who are very well adapted but weren't compatible with humans. And so we, we chased them off. So yeah, so it's an emergent and that's the whole idea of self organization. It's not self organization comes out of the dynamic interactions, it comes out of the relationships. 
And you can't find the basis of self-organization in any of the components. So you can't find the rules for the insect nest in the heads of the insects. You can't find it in the pheromone gradient either. But it's only when you have insects moving around and laying down the pheromone that you get this emergent structure. The structure comes out of that. And if you're looking for something as complicated as a structure in insects' heads, you know, a program to explain it, then you're going the wrong direction. This, this oh, yeah, looking say. for programs. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> are. But, you know, I, 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 you, I, you might have noticed that little, uh, you know, article that we have on semantic uh, cognitive perceptual computing, that the one that I sent you. Uh, the, this, not the SOA article? No, no. The oh. first one I sent you, uh, the one that... No, I didn't, uh, I didn't look at that. So okay. I'll, I'll go back and look at it. But uh, anyway, so uh, by, I, I guess I, I, um, it was a wise decision for me that um, I wanted to say uh, semantics, what is semantics, what is cognition, what is perception. And then uh, it ultimately decided not, not to break out semantic cognition and perception. Yeah, and right. No, we, say... we put it jointly. Yeah. Nevertheless... Um, and, but then we are trying to, of course, develop um, computational environment, computational system, where there are there are you know I think forms of each of these things, mm -hmm. uh, the, the computing system that behave that, that behaves that incorporates these things yeah. for semiotics and right. cognition and perception, and there we are trying to you know reduce it right. It's just like the world is analog and yet we digitize it right, so we simplify it. The same way, we have to make some pedagogical choices and try and create the boxes that we can. We know how to implement sure. algorithmically. So that's where we are. You know, we're facing. Uh, you know, I think that's that's the kind of thing we are working towards. We don't know yeah. how far we'll go. Yeah, but but uh, but, but you know, it, it, we are trying to, for example, in context of perce perception alone. I think we have uh, a viewpoint. For example, um, uh, you have a lot of data, and somehow. Uh, a computational system that abstract that abstracts it to, uh, you know, where uh, and it's not a much of the perceptual things are very hard to explain, uh, it, it, because uh, it seems to me that that's a kind of a, uh, what do you call informal uh, activity that happens in the brain. I mean, it's just hard to you know break it down in a very minute pieces. So anyway, to develop something where a lot of data is converted into something that is of use to human. To make other cognitive, you know, decisions, decisions that have you know aspect of cognition. That's what we are trying to get to. So in perception, we are trying to implement as a as a system. Yeah, the, but here here's here but here's here's one way to, to to suggest that broadening your perspective a little bit might be useful. Mm. So when you look at from perception, so so people study perception, study eyes, right? And so you know, I look at and the base that triplot tripod is occluded, right? And so I don't know do the I don't know if that's on a stand or if that's on the ground and stuff. So it's ambiguous, right? And so if someone who's saying perception has to account for those ambiguities and so I have to invent brain processes to resolve those ambiguities. But something with legs can resolve the ambiguities like this. Mm. It can move through the environment. And and a system with legs, so and, and so this is one of the key things that, that Gibson so which is sort of an intellectual tradition I come from, he argues that if you want to understand that the feet are one of the critical aspects of the perceptual system. That our ability to, you know, the way we resolve, you know, again, in the laboratory we fix the eye and we can create all these illusions. But in the world you disambiguate uncertainty. If you're uncertain about where something is and you can't see it, you can move. And your feet allow you access to information. And so if you, if you frame it as, a, you know, so there's ambiguities that people have to resolve in your database and things. You can either enrich the sensory system or the representation, the perceptual system, or you can give them a, a way of interacting and moving around in the debate, database and testing hypotheses. And, and that's what, you know, if you know Schneiderman's work, so the idea of direct manipulation is a really important innovation in terms of interface. So the idea that you can go in things and try things. So Schneiderman has an approach called direct manipulation interfaces. And often he takes complicated problems, but it's not just the representation, it's the interaction. So if you're looking for a home, it's the ability to select, okay, focus on a specific distance from the schools. Or to look at only the houses the above a certain price range, or below a certain, or with a certain number of bedrooms. And it's these, it's the action capabilities to interact and to filter in different ways and look at this from different angles that allow you 
to resolve. But if you had to try to think of that perceptually and, and take all that and represent it in a way that somebody could see what the best house for them is, is without allowing them to manipulate it in different ways, it's a much harder problem. But a lot of times, by a lot of times, if you look at it as a perception action coupling, a lot of perceptual problems can be resolved by giving action capabilities to the person. But choosing that action capability uh, is once again a kind of pragmatic problem, isn't it? Which yeah. action capability I have to choose for that perception? Yeah, and, and by the way, all design is, is an abductive, you know, we're people, and we're solving abductive problems. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you have your hypothesis about what's going to work better, best, you know, what kind of interaction, whether, you know, I'm going to use a pad or a mouse, or what's the interaction device for this, or what kind of representation, how many colors, you know, what, I, what kind of spatial metaphors I want to use. You build it, right? And that's based on your hypothesis, and then you try it out. And if it works the way you expect, then you keep your hypothesis, and the next thing you use the same kind of philosophy design. If you get surprised and discover things that doesn't work the way it is, then you make adjustments and you redesign it. And, and so, so an abductive system is just, you know, and what this argument is, is, again, the normative models are the idea that you can put in the data and process it and get truth out this end. Okay, an abductive system is learned by doing. You've got to try things, a complex world. You make guesses, you act on those guesses, and, and in fact, you've got, and, and your errors then become information that allows you to retune and, 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 and tune your guesses so that your guesses are better the next time. It's, it's a closed loop system, it's a, it's a production, it's a, and it's a process of muddling through. There, there's a, a paper that I, I think is really a couple, two papers by a guy by the name Lindblom. And you can, you can download them for free on, on the internet. One's called The Science of Muddling Through, and the other is called Still Muddling Not Yet Through. And in describing how social technical systems, how organizations make policy, the first article describes that you know, they don't apply normative models. They think it's, a, it's a political, it's messy, there's debate, and, and it's very much a muddling through process. Okay, and that, that, I think that paper was written in 59. In 79, he wrote a second paper called Muddling Not Yet Through. And he said, now, you know, in the 20 years intervening, everybody recognizes that, yeah, that people aren't doing normative model. People don't think normative rationality, that, that public policy is muddling through. But what people disagree about is the way it should be done. And so many people see muddling through as we should be correcting this, we should be training this. And he said, but the point of my art article was that muddling is actually a very effective way for dealing with complex problems. Okay, and then muddling again just means closing the perception action. It's complex, there's too many variables, you don't know what's going to work. You know, do you, you, you can either sit and think about it and put logic and stuff forever and hope you generate the right thing, or you build it and see how it works. And then if it doesn't work, it, it, you're, going to get some, you're going to get some surprises. And then you adapt it and you build it again. We, we interviewed Arthur Iberall, who designed the space suit for, uh, for, uh, for the, the moon landings and for astronauts in space and stuff. And we asked him, you know, how do you come up with these designs? And he said, you just build it. He says, and then throw it against the wall. And then you build it again, throw it against the wall. And then you build it again, throw it against the wall. And he says, when the wall is completely occluded, then you understand what the problem is. And then you can build it right. But that's the only way that, I mean, in a complex world, that's arguing that is what cow cognition works. You test your hypothesis by acting in the world, and then you adjust based on what you learn from those actions. Yeah, the adjust is something which is very important, right? When, when you say adjust, the decision you make, how to adjust something in a system, uh, is, is a pragmatic decision. So how do you model pragmatism is something which yeah, and, and it, what, but again, to model pragmatism, you have to understand what the constraints are that they're operating under, mm -hmm. as well as what their value system. So, so I mean, again, that's why it's, 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 all, it's that triadic system. So, you know, what's going to be your first guess? What's going to determine what your first guess is? Not so much what's in your head, it might be your budget, it might be the equipment that you have in mind, it might be the, the current 
suite of graduate students you have. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are many pragmatic things that are going to determine, constrain what that first guess can be. Yeah, that's true. And you just got to pick it. But, you know, the, and, and this is true in the leadership literature and stuff, the, the key to success in the world generally depends on making that first guess. And the, the worst thing is to sit and twiddle your thumbs and think about it until you have the right answer. If you wait till you know how to solve the problem to build it, it's never going to be built. It's never going to be built. You've got it. It's got to what muddling through is. You've got to, you've got to try and build it because you don't even know. And people who design things, they say, you, don't, you can't understand the problem until you try to make it. Because in the process of making it, you discover all kinds of things that you can't, you can't see from sitting on your computer and you know and and in your models you know your your models have already made so many assumptions you know you can't you've got to build it the only way to test your model is to build it in the real world and see if it works that way i think computer science has taken a big leap that is just trying to model cognition so it's trying to model systems to behave yeah, cognitively we, we have very early phase but let us um, uh, now yeah, end um, we're, we're uh, over, yeah. formally uh, John, the fact that you know, this, this talk was uh, highly successful, as you can see, so many computer scientists you know, sat, sat you know, um, for two hours, uh, asked wonderful questions, were very engaged, lively, so clearly. Uh, you are already a, a member of a faculty of Noesis, but let us formally oh, you wow. know, appreciate uh, this talk. Thank you for writing. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.